Good morning, everyone. We welcome you all to our Bible study class this morning. It is February 24th, 2018. We are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. And this morning, our moderator is Betty from California. The reading is, We must avoid the shoals of essential religion or philosophy that misguides reason and affection and hold fast to the principle of Christian science as the word that is God, spirit, and truth. This word corrects the philosopher, confutes the astronomer, exposes the subtle sophist, and drives diviners mad. The Bible is the learned man's masterpiece, the ignorant man's dictionary, the wise man's directory. And this is from Science and Philosophy in Miscellaneous Writings by Mary Baker Eddy. Thank you. Thank you. I love how it drives the viners mad. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the Bible is all and all, it's all to everyone. Which is why we study it and need to study it. So many lessons in it, which we will find more today. Shall I go ahead and uh, start on the question? Yes, if no one else has I any. just wanted to mention uh, in the preface of Science and Health, um, Mrs. Eddy mentioned, she says, the time for thinkers has come. And so that kind of made me think, you know, she's looking for deep thinkers as opposed to just the surface you know, reading of the Bible or you know, to think deeply of, of our, our reading. Thank you. Very important point. Yeah, and to read with inspiration and get rid of the material sense testimony. Like she's saying, we avoid the, avoid the shoals of a sensual religion. Mm-hmm based on <clears throat> material beliefs. I was going to call a comment on that shoals of sensual religion or philosophy as well, because I've seen so much in this world that literally just appeals to people's emotions, and that's as far as it goes. But like a shoal is very shallow, so is that approach to anything, and it, it doesn't really get you very far as opposed to appealing to spiritual sense, which takes us all the way. Thank you. I kind of get practice avoiding the shoals every week as going through the commentaries for the Bible lessons. It always yeah. ends up being something I, you know, old, old theology. theology. Well, see, and that's good you recognize it now, and you're not deceived by it. Very important. When you know the real thing, you're not deceived by the what's not the truth. And when read with inspiration, I love it. It corrects the philosopher. Yes. It corrects the philosopher because the philosopher will often drift into the human mortal belief. The Bible corrects that. And then there's the astronomer who thinks that matter is real, and it confutes the astronomer. I think what uh, she writes in the glossary also uh, impacts this a bit. She says that in Christian science, we learn that the substitution of the spiritual for the material definition of a scriptural word often elucidates the meaning of the inspired writer. On this account, this chapter is added. It contains a metaphysical interpretation of Bible terms, given their spiritual sense, which is also their original meaning. The original meaning struck me. I, 
interesting to know. Thank you. Very much so, Thank yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because the original meaning is, is the inspiration that gave rise to its being written in the first place. Yeah, that's what struck me so about the, the movie on the King James Version of the Bible was how they worked and worked and worked to get the right words, the correct words, and they went through all the different Bibles written at that time and prayed and came together. It was not done superficially at all, which is why I have great respect for the King James Version, as did Mrs. Eddy, as as do we all, I think it's fair to say. And Mrs. Eddy went even deeper, so there we are. Yeah, because that, that was the Bible that the establishment did not want to be printed. And they're still trying to mess with it. Well, still are. some establishments are, exactly. And they're also, you know, just touting it is is not relevant, relevant, <laughs> and don't bother with it. So we, that means we bother with it all the more. When you hear the American Standard Version, which I've heard in the Episcopal Church, it takes all away all of the the heart of it, the inspiration. Thank you very much, Fairly. Brings it down to the human level without any question. Thank you. Well, and this is, I think this is, this is really important because when the Bible is read without inspiration, when it's, when it's read with a critical human mind, if you will, trying to, try, try, trying to take it literally, then that is irrelevant. Yes, and I believe the reason they did it was in order to try to make it more understandable. <laughs> right. well, they're trying to appeal to the human mind. Yes. yes. It's understandable That's to who? <laughs> right. Human mind. Right. That is the mistake. And that is what makes that interpretation irrelevant. Because the human mind is irrelevant. And the remnant avoid it. And the remnant know that. Pretty relevant to the Tower of Babel. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> no, <laughs> thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks, thanks <laughs> Betty. <laughs> now we're ready. Now we're ready. <laughs> okay, good. The topic, wise in their own eyes, kind of like a legend in their own mind. <laughs> the Bible reading <laughs> the Bible readings were from Genesis eleven, one through nine. The first question where is the land of Shinar and who are they? Well it was a spacious and fruitful plain in Babylonia, later called Babel, and if you look at a map today, it looks like it's Iraq with the Persian Gulf at the southern end of it. Um, and they are the descendants of Noah's sons. Okay. Uh, does, it, does anybody happen to come across the name, what, what the word Shinar means? Land of I River. Land of two rivers is what? Oh, no, maybe not. Yeah, there actually, I yeah. found many definitions. Go ahead. Land of two rivers was one of them. Anybody? I, I got, it was an ancient name for the great alluvial tract through which the Tigris and Euphrates uh, passed before reaching the sea. Okay. Now, Shinar is the, also means Sumer, so and Sumer means the country of two rivers, being the Tigris and the Euphrates. 
often referred to as the cradle of civilization. Oh, yeah, that too. I have watch of him that sleeps. I don't know, even know what that means. <laughs> sounds like they're not watching. It sounds like they're not it sounds watching. Sounds like a bad dream. <laughs> Tom, Tom from New York, do you have anything to say? Were you ever there? I'm here. No, that's the moment. Okay. I wondered if you were ever in the land of Shinar. No, I've never been there. No. So you've never seen this tower, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I haven't seen the tower either. So. <laughs> um, I think it'll be a while before any of us will be able to get over there anyway. So. Yeah, I guess that's right. But... Mm. Yeah, I have to wait till things calm down there, I guess. Is there anything else uh, on the, the day? I would like to add about they. Is that I, what I was reading was that um, it's thought that possibly one of the leaders was a uh, descendant of Ham, who was the one that was cursed when uh, he saw his uh, father Noah. And I believe they think his name could have been um, from Cush, from Nimrod. And uh, it was also considered rebellious and um, oh, very prideful in wanting to build a great city. Thank you. Yes, and Mrs. Eddy's definition in the glossary is corporeal belief, sensuality, slavery, tyranny. Definition of ham. Yes, the definition of ham. It's interesting because she defines three of... Um, Noah's sons, and so there was Ham, and then there was Japheth, and Japheth seemed to be the more spiritual one. That definition is the type of spiritual peace flowing from the understanding that God is the divine principle of all existence, and that man is his idea, the child of his care. And then the last was Shem. And that was a corporeal mortal, kindly affection, love rebuking era, reproof of sensualism. But son of Ham definitely was not a not a good one. Not a spiritual <laughs> definition at all. Thank you very much, Linda. That's interesting. Anybody else? Okay, uh, I guess we could go ahead and move on to question two. What did they begin to build and why? They wanted to build a city and a tower. This top may reach unto heaven. I believe that the tower is called a ziggurat, and it has a square base and um, with steps. And they thought they were really taking over God's place and reaching to the heavens on their own terms. And I, I also read that they wanted to be together. They didn't want to be separated, which is not what God wanted. I think it was pride also. There was human pride that they wanted to leave some kind of uh, uh, memorial, so to speak, that here we were or here we are and we are so great and they were forgetting God. Absolutely. Uh -huh. They were being completely disobedient. God told them to disperse and replenish the earth and... They weren't going to do that. They weren't going to listen to God, whether they didn't trust him to maybe send another flood. Um, but they just thought they would do it on their own and stick together. And so they didn't go out and ha inhabit the earth like they were supposed to do. 
And how many years was it since the flood? Like a hundred, hundred and twenty. Three hundred. Three hundred. Okay. I got a, I I read a hundred, but it hundred. Okay. It was. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, yeah. I, I don't know. They're probably different. Maybe who knows? <laughs> but but it, it wasn't all that long, was it? No, it wasn't. And and how soon we forget. And that's that's the trouble, that's the difficulty we're having now in our country because all the youth and some of us have never been through war and tribulation and all of that. And and you get lazy, forgetful, and you think you can forget God. That's why, to me, one of the most significant verses in this lesson this week is and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and that's, that's the Lord's commandment, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. That doesn't mean you preach to them, but you just act like God's the most important thing in the world, and so is your Bible and science and health, and you couldn't do without them because we can't. You, your example... And someone meant, oh, sorry. And, and our testimony of why. Yes, thank you. And our testimony of why, what you were brought out of. You can't, you can't, and that's not preaching, that's sharing. And if you're reluctant to do that, that's animal magnetism. And it's, it's not just to children, but children are very important, as we talked about last week anybody, but certainly your children. Starting your starting at about the age of two. Yeah, when they're little sponges. I mean, Lawrence tells sweet stories about little Ava. But what did you tell me about Ava? <laughs> no, just little uh, prayers that she's learning. Um, there's no, no fear, no doubt, no worry, just sleep. So that's what she says, <laughs> <laughs> and she she says it. So, and and also when we have to go somewhere, I've taught her that the Christ goes before us, and the way is prepared. So every time we sit in the car, she says it. Just little things. She's Isn't that beautiful? beautiful. Mm -hmm. She's three years old. And those they, are the they, most important they, things she yeah. will ever learn. They get it. <laughs> they get it, but that's when it's truly lived. You know, you you are you're not saying it fearfully. You're not no. sending your children to Principia because you're not living science, and so you think if you send them there, they'll get it. I mean, what kind of nonsense is that kind of thinking? You ha you have to have it in your own heart, and if you don't then do, get it. There's no reason why you don't. We all have it in our heart. You just haven't developed it. You've been ungrateful for all the good that God has given us. I mean, think about, we are the country of good and plenty. But, you see, we're seeing signs of it going down the chutes to shoot. So, so why did the sons of Ham want to build this tower? Well, they wanted to reach it onto heaven, and I thought that was really interesting. That, that way back then there was already that idea that heaven was above us somewhere that <laughs> we had to go find it. Yeah, I read in Matthew Henry. He said. Um, that they built it to rival God. It was a monument of pride, ambition, and folly. And that nowhere do we find in history the name of these Babel builders. <laughs> they were, and that's a good thing. And also he made an interesting point. He said, um, these men built the Babel with brick and slime. He said, God builds his Jerusalem with sapphires and pleasant stones. <laughs> Obviously, they were in a place they didn't have stones, so 
They use bricks, which is man-made, and they use slime. We know how slippery that is. Things was just to fall apart from the beginning. Yeah, was there one good reason why they built it? Was there any? No. Yeah. no. No. Every reason, every reason was a bad reason. They didn't want to be scattered abroad, as they should have been. They, they were defying and rebelling against God. They were full of pride, and uh, it was all wrong. They you even, know, go ahead. I was going to say, they even wrote their names on the bricks so their names would be remembered forever, and no one knows their names. That's, that's right, yes. No one knows their names. I thought it was so interesting that they said that they would reach unto heaven. It seemed like such a desirable and right thing. But I just got that it was just nothing more than self-justification. Yeah, we want to build this tower, but we don't want to really tell you why. We're really going to say, we want to reach heaven. Who's going to say no to that? Well. <laughs> but even now, aren't we kind of doing that in a way in, in, all around the world, building these big buildings and it's all, uh, they put the name on it, that, that, or this, I mean, this kind of, um, or if you go to, to Bay, you see this, beautiful, gorgeous, high buildings. Um, so we're still doing it as humans. We're still trying to reach the heaven. And one of the things I well, kept a lot, seeing, a lot of it pride anyway. Yes, it is. It is very much so. And if I remember correctly, I think Mrs. Evans had an uneasy, terribly uneasy feeling about the Twin Towers when they were built. Mm -hmm. Huge, biggest. Let's be the biggest one. You know, it's. And what was it? A monument to to God? No, it was a monument to man. Yeah. It was a monument to man, and that's the test. What's your motive? If it's a monument that has some godliness to it, but even if it does, the the people of God dwell in humble tabernacles, don't they? Humility, not grandiose. Right, and are satisfied. I mean, a lot of places, you know, maybe this group built this tall one, so another one will come and build a, a taller one, and that's, you know, what's that? I felt that when we were driving a long time ago when I was first up this area. We were driving to New York City, and I saw the Twin Towers, and I said, why did they do that? Exactly. That's terrible. That's not a safe place to be to have the biggest and best in the eyes of mortal mind it because you invite everything that comes at you. Very true. I al Big target. Big target. I also have heard that they had a lot of gold stored in the basements. Of what, the Twin Towers? or the Yeah, or maybe it was Building 7 or both. Oh, uh-huh. Well, and, and I happened to watch this week something that was called... Um, I, it was either Hitler or Nazi mega structures. Barry and Uta can <laughs> chime in if they want to, but he was in the process, and he did. He built these huge, huge things, um, unbelievably big things. He was in the process of building what was called Germania, which I think was going to be seven miles in every direction, and um, was having no no cars or anything, so he already started building underground. And these things, the underground part still exists. He wasn't able to build the top ground because that's when he ran into ran into the Soviet Union. But there was another great big huge school, and the school was all for the the Aryans, the the <laughs> blonde blue eyed boys that were going to be in the army and girls too, I guess. All based on the worst reasoning and the worst motives, and, and these, some of these buildings still exist in Germany. And they're also the huge, huge, it was like a big stadium, and that's where he talked, and Goebbels talked, and where the propaganda went on. And what they would do is he said they would repeat and repeat and repeat things like how they were a superior race and the uh, Jews were not, until it was a form of... Well, it was propaganda, but it was also hypnotism and mesmerism. And um, but the point being, he was after these huge monuments to the glory of Nazism. And look what happened. And his insatiable ego. Yes, yeah. 
his insatiable ego and very godless. We also know it was based on, on Satanism and all, all of that. So we, we, Pilar is right. There's a lot of stuff going on with these towers. and All for the wrong reason. All for the wrong reason. Can't help but think about the song that the chorus sang last Sunday, In the Valley, He Restoreth My Soul. Thank mm -hmm. you. And it's mm -hmm. so true that in the valley of humility and submission to the divine, that there is a wonderful restoration going on in that state of mind. So true. And that's what's satisfied. Yes. I think the common thread is that the uh, all these huge things like the pyramids and is being discussed is to exalt person first and uh, involves a lot of enslavement in the process to exalt one person. That's very true. Yes. Yeah. Who builds these things? Slaves. Slaves <clears throat> are worse. And then there are other ways, aren't there, that mankind seeks heaven through material means. Maybe not right. by building buildings, but by... Utopian societies trying to uh, do systems of one, you know, language, but you could say one bank or one religion or one something where they're all trying to have unity but without God. Very true. Yep. Very true. I mean... That's what Hitler was going for, a thousand days of the reign of Nazism. And who's, who's running this? It wasn't, it wasn't Christ. I'm very suspicious of all these world orders or even globalism. Who's going who's gonna to be in charge of all that? Until we have the reign of Christ, I don't trust it. And then there's all these <clears throat> research labs trying to find these drugs that will... <laughs> bring heaven on earth, right? Right. The one world government, so-called, is like a counterfeit of the oneness of God. That's it. Most of these things are counterfeits of, of the true, of what's true. And when they're counterfeits, we're, they might sound good, and they might even look good, but they're not the real McCoy. And therefore, they are bad. They're actually, um, the one world order is actually kind of kept under wraps. I mean, they want to reduce the world population. They want to displace people. It's kind of based, it's totally based on a limited sense of things. But the earth needs less people because it just can't function with as many people. So we have a plan and it's just completely completely lunatic, and God is nowhere to be found in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are the things. And, the, and this is where, because they guise these things with, with propaganda, making you think it's a good thing. They don't tell you the ultimate goal that they're really trying to achieve, as, as they did not in Nazi Germany. Germany. They didn't, <laughs> wasn't until later they realized that all these people were being killed and all kinds of terrible things going on. They make it sound good, and that's where your spiritual sense, and only your spiritual sense can tell you. They make it sound good. They make evil sound good. There's apparently somewhere in Tennessee called the Georgia Guidestone, I believe, or maybe it's in Georgia, where they actually do spell it out on these big stones what the agenda is. And, and um, I've read about that. I, I should have to look that up to be for sure, but it supposedly spelled out what their real agenda is. Well, and, and thank God that we do have the time for thinkers have come. Thank God we have the remnant. Thank God we have people that are thinking. Thank God we have people that are studying the Bible that will teach you these lessons and make you suspicious of anything that deviates from what we're learning in our Bible, and in Science and Health, which is totally based on the Bible. Thank God for that, because that is going on. It's going on. But the way of the wicked, the Lord 
turn us upside down. Yes. Trust that. Yeah, you can absolutely exactly. trust it. I mean, it may take a little while to see it turning upside okay. down, but it will happen. <laughs> yeah. What did you say? The wheels grind exceeding small, slow, but they grind exceeding small? To a powder. Right, like exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, and anyone trying to do these things dishonestly or in any way, certainly wiping out race, a race, it will come back on them with accelerated force. You know, you see from this, and some of the things I read is so clearly God created one race. We are all brothers and sisters. One race. If we have different hair, <laughs> that just means nothing. It means nothing. You know, people who were from the North Country had lighter skin. It was just all a matter of where you were from, but it means zero, zip, nothing. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ, and we, as scientists, we certainly have a, a responsibility, a duty, an honor to see and recognize that. Anything else is a lie, like a so-called Aryan race. Now systems and what people believe, that's something different. That's different because um, we, we understand it is the Christ that will, that is the answer. And it's a beautiful, I don't know if you understood Benjamin's testimony on Wednesday, but it was a beautiful testimony about how he'd met. Thank you. I mean, I met a Muslim man and uh -huh. the man was asking him about God. Yeah, asking him about Christian science. And, and good questions as to about heaven and hell and, and you know, what do you not like me because of, you know, because I'm a Muslim? And, and, and Benjamin answered beautifully. We're going to have it written up as an article. Because as Christians, we love everyone and we see everyone as a child of God. But he told him what the real definition of heaven and hell is, how you live your life. You're not going to go to heaven because you've murdered other people or you think you're going to meet virgins or whatever else, other lies they get taught. But so he, and, and the man was responsive to what he had to say because it's the truth. You know, I, um, I'm very grateful for this last uh, watch uh, that we had because, uh, you know, it says uh, in your efforts to see yourself and others perfect, that you include the effort to see them seeing you in the same light. And um, I, I think, uh, to me, that that's so important. It's not just only us trying to see the other person perfect, but also to see, uh, to have the effort to to have them seeing us in the same, uh, in the same way. Um, yeah, I thought that was really wonderful, and actually, I... I been working with it, even when I'm on my way to and from work. Yeah, uh, good. good. And it's <laughs> a, absolutely wonderful and a major point in science. And Carpenter, you know, he wrote that poem about that. Because if we if we are malpracticing, if, oh, I'll see them right, but they don't see us right. Well, who says? It was something that we had been taught. The Christ in me sees the Christ in them. The Christ in them sees the Christ in me. The Christ in me sees the Christ in them seeing the Christ in them. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> now that's, yeah. that's, I think that was from the Carpenter poem. Mm. Yes, it's a perfect round, and in doing that, we heal the world. We do. Right, and that's see, that's so essential because that is part of seeing them correctly. To see them able to see things correctly themselves. It's also the greatest way to love one another. Absolutely. Absolutely, because it gets rid of all sense of hate everywhere, not only in yourself, but in others as well. And in Benjamin's testimony, everything that he was saying was through love, and he was just offering him love, and, and the men responded. Yes. Benjamin mm -hmm. is a wonderful... Uh, ambassador goes around, he meets people, he talks to people, and he can speak so they understand. It's, it's beautiful. 
I think his use of a child of God for all was also very important. He kept saying, referring to explaining with the phrase the child of God instead of, you know, Christian or this and that, more so a child of God. So, of course, he has to, he will understand. Yes. Yes, if we can get into, you know, they say well, we need more God, we need more Christ Jesus, we don't need more religion and sex. We don't. It's it's the truth, the beatitudes, more of more of the Christ, not more religion, not what divides us, but what holds us together. And there is much that does. That really says a lot about Benjamin because um, Muslims came through his home country and slaughtered Christians. They and did. for him to be able to speak to a Muslim in those terms, boy, that says a lot about Benjamin. <laughs> Absolutely, it does. Thank you. And that is the real Christ living in people. That, that can forget and forgive those injustices that have been beyond cruel. And to see, you know, when you see Benjamin, he has a light that shines in him, face. And that's why God brought him to Plainfield. That is. Thank God he did. Okay. Um, I guess we're starting question three, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we've covered part of it, but there may be some more things about why this was a mistake. Uh, we, we know that it was. Uh, does anybody else have anything on the why it was a mistake? Well, the Lord said, uh, now nothing will be restrained from them, which which they have imagined to do. And it made me think of St. Paul in Second Corinthians when he says, for, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the motive was totally impure. It, it, there was nothing about giving the glory to God. There was nothing about loving your neighbor as yourself. It was a totally selfish, impure motive. I read something I thought was good in a, one of the commentaries, and that was, the human race is not allowed to build a civilization without God, and you are not allowed to build your life without God. <laughs> That's not saying you, you know, there's no in-between there. That's, a, that's a, a law of the universe. When you try to build your life without God, You'll be miserable, and you'll continue to be miserable till you get that major point right. That's true about a civilization, too. Because God is our life. It is our life. You can't. Yeah, it's just, it doesn't work. It just, it can't be done. And then this was another. If we want to advance in God's kingdom, we must not strive to make a name for ourselves but rather humble ourselves before the Lord. And, and then that he talks about we should give up all those human ambitions and all, all has to go. It all has to go. Yeah. Matthew Henry said, those that aim at a great name commonly come off with a bad name. That's <laughs> 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 true. He that glorious, let him glory in the Lord. And then this one was um, Charles Spurgeon. May the mystic current of divine grace 
carry many of you away with its gentle force and bear you first to Christ Jesus and then to his church. I thought that was sort of beautiful. You think of the mystic current of divine grace. That, that current, that divine attraction will bring all to the Christ. The definition of Babel and Babylon is actually the same, which is uh, one word used in Strong's, which is confusion. And uh, this is Eddie writes in the glossary, Babel, self-destroying error, a kingdom divided against itself which cannot stand material knowledge. The higher false knowledge builds on the basis of evidence obtained from the five corporeal senses, the more confusion ensues, the more certain is the downfall of its structure. Thank you. That's beautiful, Mike. That is so true. And when we find all this confusion going on anywhere, you can know it's the human mind at work. That's why, although we talked about it last week, about all the gun control and other things, although I do know that there are certain things we'll have to put into place uh, to keep our children safe, to keep everyone safe. Unfortunate it's come to this point, but we will pray that those who are making these decisions will turn to God and use wisdom in their decisions. And remember, it is always God working, demonstrating, because we've talked about, too, you saw people in the right place at the right time stopping these things. In this case in Florida, nobody stopped it. Everybody was at the wrong place doing the wrong thing. Um, so we pray that everyone will be in their right place. It's demonstration. And and this is this is not confusion. This is order, God's order. Confusion shows the human mind is in full force. Anytime you're confused, stop. You're in the wrong mind. Go ahead. And uh, a very good point on that is that the Florida situation, there was an armed guard there that did nothing, and that's just shows that uh, that is the solution. You're right. You are right. Yeah, and, and yet the Georgia one with the lady who had been studying her Bible was able to stop it. She exactly. didn't have any gun. That is the point. Exactly. That is the point. Ultimately, it is God's presence and power that is going to rule the day. Thank you. I think, again, I think in that case she told him that she loved him. She did. She did. She and that God loved you. Mm -hmm. She met it with love. And this, you know, this boy that did this thing, I mean, again, where he, he was just so without God in his life. Again, God is always the answer. And we can search for other answers, but it will be the Tower of Babel until we come to this. I've heard people say, well, you know, all these things weren't happening when I was in school. I wonder what the difference is. To me, it's like, hello? <laughs> Did you have Bible in the school? <laughs> exactly. I grew up in the Plainfield school system, and we started the day with the Bible. We would read Psalms. We would say the Lord's Prayer. We would do the Pledge of Allegiance every morning. And, and when Christmas came, we did the Nativity. And, and we sang... Songs about God and Christ and Jesus at Christmas time are carols, and there was no one ever questioned it. And also, Christ Jesus and Mary Baker Eddy have many testimonies of people healed that were in that uh, fellow's situation, and it just proves that all this modern uh, medicine isn't the answer. Again, God is the answer. Thank you. Absolutely. And we don't know what these drugs are doing to people. Huh. You know, he said he heard voices, he heard demons telling him to do this. That's why last week we talked about demons. And then you put these children at an early age on these drugs and you don't know what it's doing to them. And um, 
but, it, why but you do know it's not good. It can't be good. It can't be good. And and the story that I told you about the movie Twelve Fifteen Paris, they were in, those boys were in a Christian home, and the mother, one of the mothers anyway, objected to the child being put on drugs for his whatever that is. ADD. ADD. <laughs> and took him out of that school and put him in a Christian school. They were the ones who saved the day. The three Christian men on the train. Yeah, right. I, I, I remember when my daughter was growing up, she, we had lived briefly in Bermuda, and she attended school there. And when she came back, um, um, they put her here in, in second grade according to her age. And I received a call from the teacher and said, listen, you're going to have to take your daughter to a doctor because she may have the ADD, whatever, which had just come up into the uh, spectrum of things, and everybody was, like Mrs. Eddy said, hastening to get that garment, right. that new garment. And um, I just looked at her, and I said, okay, well, I took her to a doctor that was uh, related to, to my ex-husband, and uh, and he looked at me, and he looked at the child, and examined her, and said, no. Uh, and she he warned me, he said, um, this is a new thing, a new diagnosis that has come up in the psychiatric world, and it's because they want to push this medication. She said there's nothing wrong with her. If she had that condition, she wouldn't be sitting here calmly as she is. So I went back to the teacher and said, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to deal with her. <laughs> I'm not giving her any medication. Years yes. later, my, my daughter told me that, Mom, I was poor. I already knew what she was, what they were teaching because um, they were a little ahead, I guess, in, in, in the Bermuda uh, school system. So when she came here, what they were teaching her, she said, I already knew. So, see, it, it was a simple explanation. She didn't tell me at the time that that was the reason, but if I had followed her, her, her uh, the teacher's advice, I, I would have put her on medication. She would have been like a zombie in, in, in the school. Absolutely. Thank yeah, you. Thank God you have the courage. And that is what's happening to thousands of children, but all for the wrong reason. I'd like to know what child wants to sit in a seat for eight hours or whatever, a, a day, <laughs> quietly. What child do you know? I, I know no, no child does. They're naturally. There isn't any. There isn't any. No. no. Right. It took me years to be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it now, but... <laughs> he's, he's still working on it. <laughs> but, I mean, why oh, always look to that? Why always look... The first thing you look at is, is some pill. Why? Why? Exactly. That's all the commercials on TV now. Exactly. Every single one of them. <laughs> exactly. It's just one more Tower of Babel. Yes, it mm -hmm. is, and it will come tumbling down. Okay. Is that and how old are you, 59? Oh, okay, what medications are you on? I mean, is, is that the <laughs> Anyway. Yeah, I, I got wildly, I always get, I many get of them are wildly expensive. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, at work, I always get that question, so now and then comes up, oh, this one is taking this and that for the blood pressure, for this and that. And then the, she, uh, the, the, this co-worker asked me, well, don't you take any? I said, no, I don't. And she looked at me and she said, I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. So we know it was a very big mistake because it was godless. It was godless. It was all the human carnal mind motives to do it. Pride, ambition, uh, look how great I am. You know, I can't help but think that the fact that they even built the thing, the only reason they got that far is that there have to have been a lot of smoke screens, so to speak. Because I'm just reading the first verse. It says the earth was one language and one speech. Really? Yes. God is the only one that is one and unified. But this statement is made so that I get the idea just to justify what they're doing and to quiet the opposition until it's done. The little thing came tumbling down at the end anyway. I also read that um, they built it so there was another flood. 
they would have this tower to go up. So it was like they thought they were smarter than God. Right, and according to the Bible, God said he never would send a flood like that again. Well, but the question should have been, have we stopped our wickedness and disobedience? Right. That's right. Right. So it was built out of fear, pride, all the wrong reasons. Okay, should we go on? We have yeah. more questions. Yeah, number, number four, what did the, the Lord do to them and why? It was a, well, he scattered them. He didn't destroy them. He just made them so they couldn't depend on each other in their material knowledge. He kind of said to them, I'm the boss. You are not. <laughs> <laughs> but it also says that they couldn't understand one another's speech. In other words, they couldn't communicate with each other. It was just a proof that they were not united and one on this. Confusion ensued, and they couldn't even talk to each other. Yeah, yes, it did. It was the result of their own wicked thoughts. God did nothing to them. It was their own wicked thoughts that did it. Their own wicked thoughts. And, you know, <laughs> and somewhere in Proverbs, I think it says this, that evil can never, can never what? Right, right. Prosper, but it can never get together. It, it can't unify. And you think of the carnal mind. Nobody can agree on anything. It makes me think of, the, you know, when in the old movies, when two robbers, they get together, they plan, and they go and steal something. And uh, shortly after that, they are fighting over the, exactly. the money. <laughs> they shoot each other. Shoot each other. Exactly what happened. Their own carnal mind wickedness that led to this. And I think I it's nice what Jesus said, um, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else is from the evil one. Mm-hmm. Good. Mm-hmm. No in between. Yeah, so and and there's a pretty clear divine principle in operation here, isn't there? One of my favorite statements from Science and Health. Life, truth, and love are a law. Of annihilation. Annihilation. It's all unlike itself. Exactly. That's, that, that, that's all that's going on here. There was a motive here that was unlike God, and it had no choice but to be annihilated of its own accord. And the only true unity really would be the one that has God in the, in the midst. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. And we must always remember that. We must always know that error will destroy itself. And we do not need to name names. How do we know who is, who is a just man and who isn't? Spiritual sense. Well, we don't know. We don't but, know. But God knows. God knows. We truth, can, truth knows. So when we pray, you don't aim it as individuals. You just know that the error destroys itself and that truth and love, the qualities of God, will prosper. And, so, there, and there is strength in that unity. Yes. The true unity. In our watches, we never pray for our own agenda. We just pray impersonally for truth to reign. We might have feelings of who we like and who we don't like, but ultimately that is God. God knows. And if we know the truth, God's will prevails. One of the things that, that uh, we talked about was how they, they couldn't understand each other or talk to each other, communicate, because but it, that didn't mean that they weren't able to start to learn to communicate with God and to hear his voice. 
Thank you, Betty. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.